Thank you very much, Alan. I'm here today to talk to you about one of the questions that has consistently fascinated me, and a question which helped draw me into the fields of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. That question is, what underlies our imagination? Our imagination is critical to our intelligence. It's critical to our ability to plan, to create, and innovate. Understanding how our brain works and knowing how to build an artificial brain will necessarily require an understanding of imagination. Now, my laboratory has been studying some of the components that help support imagination, and that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. But to begin with, and to be able to explain a little bit more about those components that I mentioned, I want to start with the following observation. And that is that ima imagination actually requires a connection to the real world. If your thoughts are completely untethered from reality, if they're nothing more than noise, it's just meaningless. Ask anyone who's taken too much LSD. Put another way, true imagination rests on a foundation of realism. Now, the question that we've been asking in my lab is how does your brain develop an understanding of reality that can underpin your imaginations? And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Now, you've already heard a lot about this brain structure, the hippocampus. It's a critical brain structure for our memories, and interestingly, the evidence is also very clear that it's critical for our imagination. And in particular, we think that it's critical for providing the anchor of our imagination to reality. You can see it illustrated in blue on the diagram here. And as has been already noted, uh, it's a brain structure that is hit in Alzheimer's disease very hard. And that displays to you just how important this brain region is for our cognition, given how devastating Alzheimer's is. Now, as also noted, the hippocampus is critical for your ability to store those types of memories that my colleague Adrian was telling you about, namely episodic memories, that is, personal experience memories. Your memory of your first day at school, your memory of your wedding, or even just your memory of what you had for breakfast yesterday. Now, these episodic memories, as we call them in neuroscience and psychology, rest on a foundation that we call a cognitive map. This is also something that my colleague touched on for you. We are actually collaborators, by the way. <laughs> this is why. Um, so episodic memories in the hippocampus are organized according to a very particular structure in the activity of your brain, a structure that makes reference to reality and which allows you to remember not only what happened, but where and when it happened. We call this structure a cognitive map. And roughly speaking, a cognitive map is a model of the world in your brain. Evidence shows that the hippocampus is critical for your ability to engage in imagination, as I noted, and the data also suggests that, in particular, it's the cognitive map in your hippocampus that tethers your imagination to reality. So, now what I want to do is I want to unpack a little bit more for you exactly what a cognitive map is. I'd really like you to understand this concept, even though it's a fairly abstract one that even many neuroscientists sometimes struggle with. Now, you, of course, don't actually have a map in your brain. It's not like there's a set of lines and little Google Maps markers in your hippocampus or something. So what do I mean when I say that you have a cognitive map in your hippocampus? Well, let's imagine that there are different locations in reality, in the city that you live in, for example. It could be your house, the place that you work or go to school, your favorite restaurant, whatever. And in each of those locations, let's suppose that we were able to record the electrical activity of the neurons in your hippocampus when you're located in those places. As already noted, neurons are the cells in your brain that engage in, com in computation using a combination of electrical and chemical signals. So let's say you're co located at your house. We can pretend that it's this location indicated in red on the map here. And we're recording the neurons in your hippocampus. Let's suppose that we successfully record the electrical activity of millions of neurons. Let's call that number n. Now, I'll note the hippocampus has many millions of neurons in it. So even if we just recorded a million neurons, that's still a small section. Anyway, we take all of that electrical activity of those n neurons, and we can treat that as a big list of n numbers, one number for each neuron, indicating how strong its electrical activity is. 
So if we recorded from, say, 3 million neurons, we're going to have 3 million numbers corresponding to electrical activity. And one way of thinking about that list of numbers is that it's a point in an n-dimensional space, i.e. a point in a multi-million dimensional space. So we're going to have one point in a multi-million dimensional space for when you're located at your house. This point is indicated with the, right, with the red dot on the right here. Now let's do that for all of the locations that you're familiar with. So we also put you at work, we record the electrical activity of those millions of neurons, and then we're going to get another n-dimensional point, this one corresponding to the blue point on the right. And we're going to do that for each of the locations, such that we will have one n-dimensional point for each location in reality that we record your brain activity in. What's fascinating is that when we do these experiments in animals, and we look at the structure of those points in that very high dimensional space, what we see is a recapitulation of the structure of reality. What I mean by this is that the geometric layout of the points in that high dimensional space in your brain matches the geometric layout of the locations in reality. In other words, if we did this for all the different locations that you're familiar with, we would see something that looks like a map of the places you've been in your head. It could be a city, it could be a hiking trail, or just a building you're familiar with. As long as it is places you've been and you form memories in, if we laid out the activity for all those points, you would see something that, in terms of its geometry, looks like a map. In other words, your hippocampus contains structures in its electrical activity that provide the same geometric structures as reality have, has provided to you during your experiences of it. And this is your cognitive map, a model of reality inside your brain. It's an internal map that you can use to imagine potential future scenarios. Indeed, the cognitive map, we believe, allows you to mentally travel through space and time. Because you can control that activity in your brain. You can remember what it is like to be in a specific location. And then you can imagine what it would be like to do different things there, to go elsewhere, whatever. It provides you with a means of simulating inside of your head the structures of space and time, and using that simulation to imagine different possible futures. Now we can come back to the question that me and my collaborators, including Adrien, have been studying. Namely, how does your hippocampus form a cognitive map? It has to be learned, let's be clear. You can't have, say, the structure of downtown Montreal hardwired into your brain from evolution, since none of the apes on the African savanna knew the relative location of Mont Royal relative to Place des Arts. So somehow you learn this during your life. And the question I'm going to turn to now is how does your hippocampus learn to form a cognitive map based on your experiences? Now, the way we tackle this question is using a mathematical tool called artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are abstract mathematical simulations of brains. We treat all of the neurons in the brain as a series of numbers corresponding loosely to the electrical activity of those cells. That electrical activity changes over time according to the connections between those simulated neurons. Now, interestingly, artificial neural networks are also how we build modern artificial intelligence. All of the artificial intelligence systems you've ever interacted with in recent years, whether it's a voice recognition system, an image generation system, or a chatbot like ChatGPT, are based on artificial neural networks. Now, what we've been doing in our research is that we train a simulated agent, an artificial intelligence, that possesses an artificial neural network. And what we train the agent to do is we train it to predict what it's going to see next as it wanders through a simulated maze. On the left here, you see an example of one of the mazes that our simulated agent explored. The agent itself is just a very simple simulation of a robot. All it can do is turn around, go forward, turn left, turn right, etc. But at each time step of the simulation, it receives an image of what it's seeing in the maze. And then we train its neural network to predict what it's going to see in the next few time steps as it wanders through the maze. For example, if the agent's looking at the golden shape in the corner of the maze and it moves forward, it needs to predict that that shape is going to shift slightly backwards in its vision. Here on the right, you can see an illustration of the neural network and one example of an image that it received and the prediction that it made based on that image. Now, the network can learn to do this quite well. It learns to generate pretty reasonable predictions about what it's going to see as it moves through the environment. So what happens when we train the neural network in this way? 
what happens is that cognitive maps form. Once we've trained the agent to make these predictions accurately, we can then perform the same sort of experiment I just described to you. We place the agent in different locations of these simulated environments, and we record, quote unquote, the activity of its artificial neurons in each location. Then we can look at the geometric structure in the n-dimensional space of its simulated brain. Our agent only has a few thousand neurons in its brain, so far, far fewer than you do. But nonetheless, when we look at those geometric structures in its simulated brain, what we see is a cognitive map. You can see here on the top three example environments, and on the bottom, three examples of electrical activity taken from an artificial neural network that was trained to do this prediction task, laid out in space, and the correspondence in the geometric structures is obvious. As you can easily see, the structure of each of the mazes is recapitulated inside the neural network. So the agent has formed a cognitive map, just like the one you possess. Moreover, when we simulate the agent sleeping, meaning that we don't give it an image, but we just allow its artificial neural network to drift freely, it appears to be imagining, quote unquote, moving through the mazes, exploring potential paths it could take in these environments, as if it were imagining things it could do. In other words, the agent's very simple cognitive map supports a very simple form of imagination. Hence, our findings suggest that you may learn your cognitive map by trying to predict the future. And this actually fits with a lot of neuroscience data that shows that the hippocampus is constantly making predictions about the next thing that's going to happen to you. Fascinatingly, this is also how modern AI systems like ChatGPT are trained. These systems are, at their core, simply trained to predict the next thing that they will encounter, such as the next word in a sentence that they're processing. And from this simple form of predictive learning emerges all of the capabilities that we now see in modern AI systems, including writing an essay, explaining a joke, or just engaging in conversation. All of this suggests that imagination may not be uniquely human. It may, in fact, be something that emerges in any agent that's trying to predict the future, because doing so will endow that agent with a cognitive map and will provide the tether to reality required to imagine potential future scenarios. Put another way, in learning to predict the future, you learn how to think outside the box, but just a little bit, so that your thoughts remain anchored to the world you live in to some degree. To summarize, our data, as well as data from other labs around the world, suggests that our imagination likely rests in part on cognitive maps created when you learn to predict the world around you. With AI models, we can see that happen right before our eyes, and we can watch them imagine and explore the geometric structures in their simulated brains with ease. As these models improve, their imaginations, quote unquote, will become more sophisticated, and this may end up helping us to understand more about our own imaginations. Thanks for listening.